Okay, well, thanks all of you for coming. Uh, I, saw the, I saw the list of attendees and it includes many of my former students. So, so especially hello to all of them. Uh, this is joint work with Julia Schwetz, who's at Christ College. And um, we should start by acknowledging excellent cooperation from the admissions office, my former postdoc, Renata Rabovich, and the former undergraduate student, Emily Song, for research assistance. Um, this work is partly funded by the ERC grant, and it reflects the views of the authors and not of Cambridge, Christ, and Trinity College. Okay. So what's, what's the story here? The story is that uh, it's commonly claimed that elite colleges are, uh, do their admissions in, in biased ways. Okay. So uh, a, um, uh, a quote from the Sutton Trust in 2018 is, is this, which says that just eight schools send as many pupils to Oxford as, as 3,000 other schools. And this is a fairly international uh, problem issue. And Harvard admissions have been uh, subject to a lot of criticism uh, recent, uh, recent, recently, those of you are following this, this news. On the other hand, if you look at what the universities say, that you know, places like Oxford and Cambridge say that they're, they're trying to get the best candidates, irrespective of, of backgrounds. And so the question we are trying to address is, can we look at real data, micro data on admissions and how students do after they get admitted to answer the question of whether admissions are actually merit-based? Okay, so when we think about what fair admissions or merit-based admissions mean, we have to uh, distinguish between uh, what you might call equal success rates and what you might call equal outcome thresholds. Okay, I'll, I'll make this clear in a bit. Um, and in order to do that distinction, you need to be careful about what kind of things we observe as researchers and what kind of things we don't. Okay, so here is the basic story here. Okay, so on the on the horizontal axis, we have um, a measure of perceived ability of the applicants. So people who are applying, you can rate their abilities on that scale, and then put a horizontal line. So this this vertical line here, the red line is a threshold and anybody who's above that threshold gets in, anybody who's below that threshold doesn't get in. Okay? So that's what you would call a merit-based admissions system. Okay? And what these two graphs, these two red and blue curves they're, they're showing you is the distribution of ability in these two groups that I've called blue and red. Okay? You can think of men and women, you can think of state school, private school. Okay? So once you hold every, everyone to the same threshold of merit, you can see that the area under these curves to the right of this threshold are different under the two curves, okay? What that means is that the blue tie people have higher success rates than the red tie people when we hold everyone to the same threshold, and that's because the right tail of these distributions are different, okay? The other way to do this is that you say that, well, I don't care so much about merit. What I want to do is I want to equate the success rates of two groups. But if the two curves look like this, the only way you can equate the success rate is by having different thresholds for different groups. So in this case, for example, the blue people are being held to a higher threshold than the red people, but the area under the blue curve to the right of the, of the uh, blue vertical line is the same as the area to the right of the red curve in the right. So this is where the, the success rates are equal, but the threshold for merit-based admissions are different for the two groups, okay? And it's the former thing that I would associate with merit-based admissions. And so the question is, can we tell by looking at data as to which of these cases is actually, you know, which of these things or maybe none is actually taking place in admissions. Okay. So what is the challenge in doing this? The challenge, of course, is we don't know what the thresholds are. And there are lots of things uh, that admissions are based on, including things like reference letters that we as researchers are, you know, are not going to be able to see because that compromises with anonymity. Okay? So the question is, how do we figure out which of these stories is correct by some other way? And the idea that we are going to use is we're going to look at Cambridge admissions and we're going to use the pool uh, for admissions to, to figure this out. So what, how does this work? So how it works is just think of one group. Let's just say these are the blue type people. So how does admissions actually work? So once we have got all the data on everybody, exam scores, interview performance, the, the admissions, you know, people doing admissions split the students into three groups, okay? People who are 
to the right of the rightmost threshold, the rightmost vertical line, they get in straight away. People who are to the left of the, the leftmost vertical line, they are not accepted. And then people in, in between, they're put in this what's called the pool, it's like a wait list. And then among the pool, the best people are eventually picked up by colleges which haven't filled all their places. Okay. And the same thing happens for the red people. Now the, now, the point is that if these thresholds are the same for both groups, then everybody, everybody from the blue group who got in through the pool are below the threshold, the original threshold, and everybody who got in directly from the red group are to the right of the, of the threshold. Okay, so if the two thresholds are the same, we should expect that all these blue people who got in from the pool should be doing worse than all the red people who got in directly. Okay, so we're going to compare these two, these two groups. And if we find that the former, that is people who, the blue type people who got in from the pool are doing better, that suggests that the threshold for admissions is higher for that. The, the good thing about this is that we don't need to know what the admissions criteria were, um, which variables are observable. The, we all, I mean, just by looking at the pool, we can tell who got in, uh, from, from this group and who got in from that group. So that's, that's the insight in this, in this work. So what happens if I apply this data, uh, apply these ideas to the data? So what is the data? What are the data? So these are people who entered Cambridge to between 2013 and 17. So some of you might actually be in my data set. Uh, we look, looked at these uh, fairly competitive subjects, economics, Natsuki, physical, engineering, math, and then ASCII bio, law, and medicine, and the outcomes we're going to look at on the basis of which we decide we, uh, who, uh, on, you know, on the basis of which we measure uh, ability is the, the standardized TRIPOS score in each year of your, of your study. Okay, these are standardized by subject. And the other thing we observe about the students is whether they came from the pool, whether, or what their gender is, and what kind of school they came from. So, so the good thing about this, this whole strategy is that we don't need to know anything about people who did not get in. And for people who did not get in, obviously we don't have any other measure of, of ability, but it's only for people who got in that we observe how they did once they got in. So our strategy is only going to use those people and that's fine because that's, the, that's our test. Okay. So what happens if you do this? So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to calculate the average of these groups and compare the average with that group. So if, if this average is higher, that suggests that the threshold is higher for that group. So let me first tell you what happens when you, when you look at the admission success rates. Okay? So if you look at STEM and economics, the male female, so this is by gender and this is by school type, the male female difference is not that large. The state private difference is quite a bit large. So private people are doing much better in terms of their success rates. Okay, the same for the non-STEM subjects, where uh, the males have a slightly higher chance of getting in, but the private ones um, have a significantly higher chance. However, this, by our criteria, is not. Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about whether admissions are merit-based or not. But, so what happens? So now we're going to do this comparison of comparing the average of this group with the average of this group and see what that tells us. Well, that's what, that's what it tells us. So if you look at the uh, performance of the pooled males, so people who, the male students who got in from the pool and take away the, uh, the average score of the female students who got in directly, then for the E-STEM fields, you see there's a significant positive difference, okay? So the males who got in through the pool are doing significantly better. So 0.24 means it's 0.24 standard deviations higher. Okay, and these are statistically highly significant. Okay, and this is based on first year performance. What happens in later years is that the 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 gap falls a little bit, but it still stays high and remains statistically highly significant. Okay, interestingly, if you now look at law, medicine, and Natsuki biology, there's no difference. Okay, we can't tell whether these people are different from these people. Okay, and these results are robust to things like subject fixed effects, college fixed effects, all kinds of things. So there's no way we can talk with these results. Okay. Um, so why is this happening? Okay, so why is it that these people are doing so much worse? These 
these directly admitted women. So what one of the things we did is that we looked at how they did before they came into Cambridge. And this is being done solely for home students who did their A-levels and so forth. So if you look at GCSEA stars, okay, the directly admitted females are actually doing significantly better. Okay, so this, this number is negative, which means that the directly admitted females have much better GCSEA star records than the pooled males. If you look at AS level scores, it's not quite that high, but it's still negative and highly significant. <clears throat> so the only thing in which these pooled males are doing better in terms of pre-Cambridge test scores is the AS mass in which they're quite, quite a bit stronger. Okay. Um, what happens if we now apply the same idea to school types? The answer is nothing happens. There's no, there's no evidence of anyone being held to a higher standard than anybody else when you look at school types. Okay. Um, so these are sort of the summary of the findings. So in uh, STEM and economics, <clears throat> non-pooled females are scoring significantly lower in their first year exams. And this difference persists, although uh, it doesn't disappear. And it doesn't, uh, sorry, it, dis it falls in magnitude, but doesn't disappear. And part of uh, the fall could be attributed to uh, choice of optional subjects. So how, um, you know, people can, uh, you know, sort themselves better into options in, in their later years. And that's probably partly responsible. This is a question we haven't settled fully, but that's something we are looking at. Uh, it doesn't happen for the non-ESTEM subjects like law and medicine, which are almost equally competitive to get into. Medicine is probably the hardest to get into, but there's no such difference in those subjects. And the evidence for maintained schools versus private schools is not very significant. We don't, didn't see any strong patterns. What are the, the follow-up questions that, that we're working on? So the first, obviously, is why is it that ESTEM, in, at e, in ESTEM, the female students are performing poorly? Is there some kind of bias in marking, implicit bias? Because when uh, examiners mark your scripts, they don't know your identity. They just see the number. So, but is there some kind of, because most people who are marking are men. So is, it, is there something along those lines that we should look into? There's some evidence in psychometry that uh, if you have big stake exams at the end of the year, then uh, women do worse than men. Whereas if you have incremental exams, small exams regularly, women tend to do better. Is that what's going on here? The, the bigger question is how do we design admissions and assessments optimally? And this sort of goes back to what iTech was talking about before. So how do you optimally do admissions? And then once you have admitted people, how do you optimally do assessments to really understand um, ability? There's a lot of interest in these questions among students. I often use this to teach my courses. And uh, I've had many requests from undergraduate students saying that I want to work on this project because it's very close to their heart. Um, and uh, the sort of the bigger agenda that this fits into, the bigger agenda that I work on is this question of how do you target policies to maximize aggregate outcomes and utilities. So that's what I work on, and this is one small part of that. Okay. And here are some references to the work, uh, to papers that are related to this stuff. Uh, I did a similar work and had very similar findings in Oxford da using data from Oxford, uh, although my sample was much smaller there, but the, the general uh, the, the nature of the substantive nature of the findings, the gender and the school type gap was very similar there. Okay, and then I have other papers in, in similar vein. But so this paper, for instance, I had used data from Dartmouth College to figure out how do you optimally assign roommates to maximize outcomes and so forth. So you can look at the rest of the papers on my website if you like. And that's all I have. Thank you for listening.